Oh, hey everyone, welcome to uh, today's DHG accounting workshop. As I said, my name's uh, Ashley and I go by she, her pronouns. I'm also here accompanied by Raphael, who will be helping me with some breakout rooms. We're really trying to make it as uh, fun as possible. Um, so yeah, before we begin, I'd really like to uh, thank Aster for inviting me to give this workshop, and I'm super excited to be here for you today, like I said. I'd also like to quickly mention the different groups you see on the screen who work key in making this accounting workshop for McGill, as well as Megan McKenzie, who couldn't be here today, but I'd like to give her credit as well. So we created this workshop um, about two years ago, and it's been given to Master Leah McGill, so we hope you enjoyed it as well. So I'd also like you to encourage you to have some paper and a calculator out for notes and calculations. And uh, we'll be sharing the slides with you all along, but you know, feel free to encourage to take notes so that you get the most out of this. Uh, with regards to questions, uh, feel free to write them in the chat. Raphael will be monitoring those. Uh, if it's something relevant right away, we could bring it up, make it interactive. Otherwise, we can address it later. And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge something. Well, I am very passionate about GHG accounting and have, um, have myself completed this protocols training standard. I am in no way an expert. And if there's any questions that you come with that I can't answer right away, I'll make sure to look into it or get you the right resource. So that's all for now, let's get started. All right, so for this first section, there's no better place to start than what is greenhouse gas accounting and why do we care? Both are really big questions and I wanna give you clear answers so that you can see the value in the skills you're about to learn. Greenhouse gas accounting, also abbreviated GHG accounting, is an assessment that quantifies the total amount of greenhouse gases produced directly or indirectly from a business organization's activities. This assessment is then usually reported yearly in the GHG inventory, which sums up the organization's carbon footprint for that respective year. As for the why do we care, from the career or professional aspect, the skill of GHG accounting is becoming more and more of an asset because many companies are being required to include mandatory GHG uh, accounting into their uh, director's reports. This application is still really new. Before about 2010, it would have been practically unheard of. And with it comes many new positions to be filled. Shua, do you hear that noise really loud? Okay, so sorry guys, there's construction downstairs. Give me two seconds, so sorry. All right, sorry, I apologize so much for that. <laughs> All right, so let me get back into it. I was talking about why we care and the fact that this is becoming a really big new obligation for companies. So before about 2010, it would have been practically unheard of. And with this new position comes many new positions to be filled. Next, what brings me to personally why it's the most important is that everybody should know about a little bit of greenhouse gassing because all, sorry, because we all know that large corporations demand to like listen to the, the, the demands of their consumer base in order to thrive. If we as consumers and future stakeholders are educated on the topics of GHG accounting and aware of its importance, we can keep companies accountable for their emissions and push them to adopt production initiatives. So the introduction we hope to provide you with today will give you valuable skills for the workplace and also knowledge to really understand what's going on next time you see the words GHG accounting or carbon footprint in the news. Okay, <clears throat> so now I think we're getting ready to get right into it. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which was established, which is the most widely established and used standard and tool to measure, manage, and report on the emissions of the seven greenhouse gases regulated under the Kyoto Protocol. Their 10-hour corporate standard training is the basis of what we'll be presenting to you today, and we encourage you to check up on their website and the standards itself to learn even more. 
So the GHG protocol has four general objectives. Number one, to simplify and reduce the burden of measurement and reporting. Two, to illuminate reduction opportunities and enable market-based um, options. Three, to support management action and stakeholder reporting. And four, to enable credible, transparent, and consistent information flow across multiple borders and jurisdictions. It was originally published in 2001 and then revised slightly in 2004, and it includes six major standards, seven section standards, and over 25 additional tools, which were all produced through the collaboration and contribution of over 350 experts. So a ton of people worked on these. I mentioned before that it is the most widely used standard. And to give you a bit of perspective on that, in 2016, at least 92% of the Fortune 500 companies reported that they use the GHG protocol directly or indirectly through another program based on it. This includes many huge companies like Ford, IBM, Pfizer, Hasbro, Ikea, Starbucks, Nike, so many more. So, these standards divide emissions into three different scopes, which you might have heard about already. I don't want to get too much into details right now because we're going to cover it again really soon. But the basic point is that emission sources fall into these different categories based on whether they are internal to reporting company or that they exist up or downstream along its value chain. In the corporate standard, which is the one we're discussing today, scopes one and two are mandatory to be covered, but the inclusion of scope three is optional. So this isn't to say that scope three isn't important. It's actually the largest source of emissions for most companies. It's just that it's far more complex than the other two scopes. So the GHG protocol has created a complementary, a complementary standard and training for it like separately. So tonight we're gonna to be referring, well today, we're gonna to be referring a lot to McGill's most recent 2019 GHG inventory for examples and practice. And they actually did decide to include all three scopes. So including scope three. So it's a really great one that we've been working with at McGill. And I would encourage you to um, either see if your university has one or encourage them to make one themselves. We're gonna be using McGill's one as a standard today for our practice. Okay, so now just like financial or any other kind of accounting, there are certain principles required by the GHG protocol to ensure that inventories represent a faithful, true, and fair account of a company's emissions. Otherwise, it isn't really useful to us. So these include providing rele relevant details to all parties that are required to make decisions, completeness that involves documenting small emission sources, which can be significant as large ones, consistency of accounting approaches, inventory boundaries, and calculation methods across the years of reporting, accuracy to report values with as little uncertainty as possible, and transparency that clearly outlines any assumptions, changes, or exclusions. So these principles are the ideal, and sometimes it will be necessary to make trade-offs. Say, for example, you use a standardized emission factor to ensure completeness instead of reporting the more accurate measured value, since there weren't measurements for everything. And that's perfectly okay to make those trade-offs. It's just important to also make sure it's stated and explained transparently in the inventory for the reasons they were made. All right, so I told you we're looking to make this a little more engaging than just a talk. So here's a warm up for what's to come. If everyone can open up their chats or their cameras or however you'd like to interact, we're going to be testing your skills with some examples from the Miguel GHG inventory. So I'm going to give you an excerpt from the report, and I'd like you to tell me what principle it corresponds to. So there's a little tip. Sometimes it could be more than one. So get ready to mark it down in the chat. This is our first example. So here we have a list of activities excluded from the inventory. So for example, in research experiments, there was these specific things excluded for the rationale of incomplete data. And secondly, that the calculating and or monitoring types and amounts of experiment products and byproducts is currently unfeasible. All right, so out of relevance, transparency, consistency, completeness, and accuracy, which one would this really refer to? I know we're not too many, so I'm expecting the few of you there to respond. <laughs> Would that be accuracy? Or yeah, completeness? accuracy is a very good one. Like I said, there's many. So the one I came up with isn't accuracy, but it does definitely apply. 
So for this one specifically, I was saying transparency. So this was kind of the disclosure of, hey, we did exclude these and it's for this reason. And because of that, we're being more accurate with what we're reporting. So yes, very good, thank you. All right, next. So this example it, on page six is written over consecutive assessments. We ensured that all activity data is captured and included. So I'll read it again, over consecutive assessments, we ensure that all activity data is captured and included. Would that be consistency and completeness? Yes, amazing, exactly. So yeah, consistency across the different years of counting so that when you look back through the years, you could actually make comparable assumptions and completeness, which is said that everything is captured and included. Very good, thank you. All right. Um, think that I have one more. So in this one, it says the following table briefly outlines the calculated methods used. Detailed calculation methodologies are included in the appendices, and there are several acronym used, including FAMIS, oh, I don't even I know how to say that one, MDD, ELCC. So this one's a bit trickier. Anyone have any ideas? I think either transparency for like showing the types of methods used or or accuracy because it, it is like a methodology kind of point. Very true. I put for this one relevance because I really felt that in this by giving these details and the acronyms, they made it more accessible for any group of people to see it. So someone who might not be in the facilities management might not know what that acronym is. So for them to be able to interpret the data, giving them these acronyms, letting them know how the process was done, made it more accessible. So relevant to the groups that were available, but definitely transparency and accuracy as well. So like I said, McGill was pretty good. <laughs> they managed to incorporate most of the five in them in a lot of their sections. So um, hats off to them. Okay, great. Thank you so much for participating. Okay, I know that last part may have been a little bland. I mean, these accounting techniques are something that's pretty standard and it's not what the meat we're going to, but it is really important if you wanna make sure that the inventories you create someday become meaningful. Our next topic is gonna to be all about setting boundaries, which means well-defining the limits of what needs to be accounted. There are more specifically two boundaries that we're gonna be talking about. One of them is organizational and the other one is operational. So personally, when I was looking through it, um, I find the words so similar that they keep getting mixed up in my mind all the time. So just to make it a little simpler for the purpose of this workshop and this workshop only, I'm gonna be calling organizational boundaries, system boundaries instead. Like I said, just for this workshop. All right. So when I say system boundaries, I'm gonna be talking about which of the company's activities are included in the inventory. When I say operational boundaries, it's gonna be about the emission scopes, the scope one, two, and three we talked about before that those activities fall into. So let's jump into some more details on each. First off, when we're talking about these system boundaries and what activities a company should account for, it isn't as simple as just saying all of their activities. Many businesses have very complex structures with subsidiaries, joint ventures, franchises, investments, and a ton of other subsystems. To ensure consistency across the years and within the organization, it's really important to specify who accounts for which activities and how much of each of them. So there's three main ways of doing so. The first one is by equity share where a company will account for activities based on their percent of ownership. The equity share approach reflects economic interest, which is the extent of rights a company has for the risk and rewards of their activity. So I think the best idea to, go, to understand this is to go through an example. So let's say our company has factory A and factory B, which belongs to it, each of which are kind of have an emission of a thousand megatons of CO2 equivalent per year. In terms of our company, he has a 50% equity share in factory A, which means that he will account for 50% of the 1,000 megatons of CO2 equivalent per year, totaling the 500 megatons. Versus if he has an 85 equity percent of the share of factory B, can you guys let me know how many um, megatons he would be accounting for? Is anyone good at their quick math or actually took out their calculator before? <laughs> 
850 megaton exactly <laughs> dead on so 850 megatons of co2 equivalent per year which therefore gives them a total of 1350 megatons so that's kind of how the percent ownership works of the equity share alternatively there's also the operational control approach where accounting is based on the authority to introduce and implement operating policies this approach is actually the most common and it's adopted in probably 80% of companies. It's also the approach that personally McGill has decided to take on for their inventory. So if, for example, McGill co-owns the Neurological Institute with the hospital here and but holds the responsibility for operating and maintaining. For this reason, they have operational control over the building and are required to report all associated emissions. So even though it's jointly owned, operational control or is an all or nothing approach where you account for 100% emissions if you have it and 0% if you don't. So let's try again with our company. We have again factory A and factory B. In this case, factory A is generating 900 megatons of CO2 equivalent per year and factory B is generating 40,000. So our company has operational control over factory A. So According to the operational control system boundary, how much of that CO2 equivalent will they be accounting for? Also, if you don't feel comfortable talking, feel free to write in the chat. Just give me a number. You don't even need to put the units. Nine hundred. Yes, exactly. So since they have con operational control, they account for nine hundred, the entirety of it. Versus if it does not have operational control, how much of that 40,000 will we be reporting? Hey, one, no, 40,000 is a pretty big amount. Sorry, what was that? Like none of it? None of it, exactly. So it's really all or nothing based for operational control. Meaning that the total of 900 plus zero 900 total. All right, now lastly, we have financial control, which is an approach based on the ability to direct an activity's financial policies. In order to know what percentage of emissions a company should account for when they're considering the voting rights and the financial accounting status. So calculation wise, it's kind of a mix of the last two methods. So look at the emission factors for three different companies. So factory A has 750, factory B 1000, and factory C 450. So in factory A, it has financial control, which means that it will account for 100% of the megatons. In factory B, since it does not have financial control, it will account for none of it. And if it's a 50% joint financial control, it will account for the half. So like I said, kind of a mix of the last two methods for therefore the total of the sum of the different factories. So at this point, some of you may be wondering if all the approaches give the same quantity of emissions. And the answer is no, they won't all give the same quantity of emissions. As you can see from this example I have on the screen, they're actually quite different. Um, and that's okay. There are many factors in choosing which approach best suits a company and their complex structures. Everyone will be different. What is important, though, is that you remain consistent with the same approach within an organization and across the years. This way, the data that you obtain will be comparable and it'll be easier to avoid double counting the admissions. So essentially, when you pick one, you got to stick to it to make sure that it has that value like we were talking about before. So with the different approaches, you can see I should put that up earlier. That's the it can be pretty significant differences. Okay. So now we're going to switch gears and go into that operational boundaries, which are the three different scopes I mentioned quickly at the beginning. So these scopes fall into two categories. So either direct, which means that they are produced from the source that a company owns, or indirect. Under the corporate standard, like I mentioned, scopes one and two are required, but scope three is optional. So let's dig into these a little bit more. 
So firstly, for direct emissions, direct emissions come from the company, uh, sorry, from a source that the company owns or controls. Some examples of this would be the generation of electricity, heat, or steam, which happens on site, physical or chemical treatment or processing, the transportation of materials, products, waste, or employees owned by the company, or fugitive emissions. So talking about fugitive emissions, those are any kind of emissions that are unintentional leaks emitted from sealed surfaces, such as packages or gaskets or leaks from underground pipelines is another example. Next, we have scope two. Scope two is probably the most simple. Scope two includes all indirect emissions from purchased electricity, steam, heating, and cooling. So any kind of purchased energy. If the energy is made on site, it'll be scope one. Any other types will be scope two. And then lastly, scope three is where it gets a little bit messier. This is the biggest of the scopes, and it will mostly include everything, which is why it isn't included necessarily in the corporate standard. It has its own training. Some examples would be transport of vehicles that aren't controlled or owned by the company, um, energy consumed by the consumer after buying the company's product, uh, the employees commuting to work, or the end-of-life treatment of the company's products. So this includes, like we said, both some upstream activities, which happen before the product or the service is produced, and downstream resulting activities. Okay, so now I'm giving you another chance to practice and we're going to make to make sure you understand the different scopes. So if you have any questions right now that you need clarifying, go ahead. Otherwise, we're going to send you into a breakout room. I don't know. Yeah, we have enough people, so we'll put you in a breakout room and uh, you'll be given this activity that is the McGill's reported inventory in 2019 inventory. So you'll have 10 minutes to decide which activities should belong under which scopes and then drag them accordingly in the document. So let's say you see here purchase steam. Ah, well purchase steam, I remember falls into scope two. You drag the white block into the blue one. So we'll give you 10 minutes to work together through this. Um, Raphael was gonna drop the link uh, to the Google Drive in there and you could just click on the document of the number of your breakout room. So before I let you loose, uh, let's just make sure the scopes are clear. So if you could help me out in the chat, that would be super great. In a few words, can you quickly describe what is scope one? If anyone wants to write it. Yeah, that's the link for the breakout room. Okay, well then I'll go through quickly. Scope one is any kind of emissions generated by the company on site owned or controlled by the company. Scope two is any indirect um, electricity that is consumed. And scope three is any other indirect consumptions. So uh, we sent you the link. So Shua, do you wanna open the breakout room? And if you have any questions, feel free to call us in and the breakout rooms aren't recorded. So you can feel free to turn on your mics or your cameras and interact together in there. Here are the answers. So you can compare with uh, what you've done. Um, so I don't know if that was too long, not enough time. If you have any suggestions, we are going to have a breakout room later so we could uh, adjust. So like I said, these are the answers. This is how they were classified in the McGill 2019 inventory. Um, does anyone have any questions, clarifications? Is this kind of what you got? Um, Or nothing in particular. I'm going to assume that you guys all got it perfectly. <laughs> so everything we can review, everything in scope one emissions were kind of produced uh, directly on site at McGill or controlled by McGill. So this includes any uncontrolled leaks. So here we have the examples of uh, insulating gas and refrigerants. Um, we also have on site stationary combustion at McGill um, in two different forms. We also have a McGill owned fleet of vehicles, including some buses as well as maintenance uh, vehicles and uh, livestock and fertilizer for our um, kind of uh, our, uh, our studies at the Mac campus, which is more agricultural focus. Our scope two emissions are the first type of indirect emissions that come from purchased electricity, steam, and hot water, which you see all these examples in the McGill inventory. And lastly, scope three being external um, uh, to, well, sorry, 
also um, indirect emissions, but external to those purchased electricity. So including distribution losses, water treatment, uh, McDonald's Shuttle, which is a kind of like transport not owned by McGill, as well as student commuting, sports team traveled, and any uh, directly financed air travel. So if there is no questions, um, let me continue. So I thought it might be interesting to you to see what the breakdown result is by scope. So you can see that it's about 30% for scope one, 7% for scope two, and 63% uh, for scope three. So this is where you see the big part of scope three. And maybe you would think that McGill would consume more than just 7% for all its electricity and energy needs across its buildings and operations. But for uh, building, uh, for office buildings, scope two usually produces the highest amount of emissions. So, but for McGill, it ends up being a lot of other things. Anyways, that is the first part of our training. So let's get back into it. Now we're gonna start our second half. This is all gonna be more quantitative instead of qualitative about how to track, calculate and report emissions. So, to track emissions over time, you need to select a base year to which you make a reference from now on. So this allows you to track progress towards reduction targets and puts effect the inventory changes into context to what you've already done. So the base year is the earliest year with verifiable emissions data for the required scopes. So quickly to mention it again, the required scopes in the GHG protocol are only scopes one and two. So the base year is typically one year in particular. For McGill, it's 2015, but it can also be an average of consecutive years if there's a lot of fluctuation between years, which can be possible for certain organizations. Oops, sorry, I clicked off of it. All right, so sometimes you're forced to recalculate base year emissions. So things change and sometimes retroactively recalculating your base year will help you ensure consistency and relevance, which we mentioned before are very important for our emissions data. We'll talk, a, uh, we'll talk later about when you have to recalculate, but to recalculate the base year, you must number one, develop a recalculation policy and apply it in a consistent manner. And two, also state the basis and the context for any recalculations. For example, in the 2018 McGill inventory, McGill had to recalculate its base year because it received updated data from heating oils used at our MAC campus. So it also optionally chose to recalculate the following years as well. So if you need to retroactively correct your base year, you can only correct the base year, but you can also go one step further and apply those corrections to all the following years as well. So this allowed for McGill to have a more meaningful comparison between their years, even though it isn't mandatory. All right, so when do we recalculate? We want to recalculate in three uh, specific cases. The first one, if there is significant change in the structure or organization of the company. Two, if there is significant changes in the calculation methodology, for example, improved emission factors become available or improved activity data. And number three, any discovery of uh, errors that seem significant. So. Is anyone starting to notice a pattern between these different things? Maybe, maybe not. One thing is that they are all significant. So what do, what do we mean by we say significant? It means that it surpasses a specific significance threshold. So i.e. a criteria used to determine whether a change of significant is warranting of a recalculation. So the GHG protocol does not specify a significance threshold. It's on the backs of each company and each organization to define their own significance threshold that will trigger a base year calculation. So this will differ for every company, but it does need to be set. Okay, with respect to structural changes, uh, this refers to the transfer of ownership or control of emitting um, activities from one company to another. This includes anything that ranges from a merger, acquisition, any divestment activity, outsourcing, insourcing, or 
um, of emitting factors. So this would constitute a significant structural change and would therefore trigger a necessary recalculation. So when do you not need to recalculate the base year? So this involves any changes that in which, sorry, changes involving a facility that didn't exist in the base year. So let's say something didn't exist and then you now does exist and you decide to count it. You don't need to recalculate because you didn't have it in your base year. Secondly, if there's in or outsourcing of activities previously recorded in another scope, so if the scope changes also doesn't need a recalculation, or if there is organic growth or decline. So let's look at an example now. Company X has two facilities, A and B. In its base year, it produces 50 tons of CO2 equivalent total, 25 each. In its second year, it experiences an increased production and emits 60 tons, so 30, 30. So pop quiz, would this need to trigger a base year recalculation? So feel free to speak up, type it in the chat. So this is an increase in production over years of the same facilities. Feel free to message it in the chat. If not, I'll just go on in a couple seconds. But I would love to get your input. Like I said, we're really trying to make this interactive. So does this trigger a base year recalculation? No, amazing. Thank you, Katrina. So no, organic growth does not trigger a base year calculation. For the beginning of, okay, great, sorry. <laughs> in the beginning of its third year, now in this example, it acquires facility C. So to keep up with this growth. So it had natural growth and now it's not big enough. It's acquiring facility C. So uh, what would your total emissions for year three be? And does this trigger a base year recalculation? So now it's acquired facility C, which in year three has a 20, uh, 20 kind of input to the CO2 equivalents. Does this trigger a base year recalculation? I'll give you a couple of seconds. Yes, thank you, Evan, it does. So like we mentioned, any acquisitions uh, of significant emissions will trigger a base year recalculation. So in year three, we end up having 30 plus 30 plus 20, which is 80. And now we're re-triggering our base year calculation. So our base year is now gonna be 25 plus 25 plus 15, which is now 65. If we wanted to also recalculate the year number two, we could do that, it is optional, but now it would be 80. Great, so let's do one more example. Company C has three facilities, A, B, and C. In its base year, it emits 75 tons of CO2 equivalent. In year two, it experiences an increase in production and emits 90 tons of CO2 equivalent. All right, time for input again. Does this one trigger a base year recalculation? Kind of similar to the last. Would this increase in production result in a trigger of the base year recalculation? No, exactly, thank you. So organic growth does not trigger base year recalculation, so we would just stick on the same track. At the beginning of its third year, it divests from, fa uh, from facility C. So in this case, facility C is divested. Um, what would year three's emissions be and does this trigger a base year recalculation? So divestment would actually recal uh, trigger a recalculation. So year three would now be equal to 60 instead of 90. And we would go back to year one, recalculate, and we would end up with 50 instead of 75. Okay, last example. Company Z has two facilities, A and B. In its base year, it has 50, and in its second year, its increase in production emits 60. Does this trigger a base year calculation? Like we said, no. Any organic growth will just remain as is. 
In year three, it acquires a new unit, C. But this company did not exist in the base year. Does it require a base year recalculation? And in this case, it's no, because even if you did recalculate it, not existing means it had zero emissions. So there would be no need to recalculate the base year. You would simply add your 20, your company, uh, your facility C to the remainder of your company, and you would end up with a total of 80 for your current year. Year two as well could be recalculated if you so desired to, but it is optional. If you were to recalculate it, you would add in your additional facility and end up with 75 tons of CO2 equivalent. All right, now this is the real meat of it. So let's get into the fun part, actually calculating the emissions. So I've given you a nice structure of everything around. So now you're ready to get through the actual steps. So the first step in calculating emissions is to identify emissions. In the case of McGill, we had the scope one, two, and three, which they did decide to include all of them. There are three ways to calculate emissions. There is number one, you could direct measurement, which monitors GHG concentrations with a flow rate. You could do stoichiometry, stoichiometry calculations, sorry, <laughs> which measure elements that enter and leave the system. Or you could do an estimate approach, where you multiply activity data by the appropriate emission factor. So we're going to be focusing on the estimate approach since it's the most common approach. It's often very hard to measure something directly or to use calculations. So we use estimates. Oh, sorry, they're written right there. All right. So in our estimates, how it works is we are going to multiply our activity data by our emission factor to get a certain amount of tons of emissions. So what would be an example of an activity data? So does anyone want to give an example of an activity data? A little bit hard. I haven't told you what it is yet. Maybe like a, a utilities bill? For your yeah, hydro? exactly. A certain amount of something released, for sure. Um, it could be uh, a distance driven, it could be um, uh, the length of uh, the duration of a certain emitting process, for sure. So any kind of emitting activity would fall within there. And then the emission factor is typically given by research or other sources and uh, we'll be able to provide you with. So then we are going to, once we get our tons of emission, we need to make sure to convert it into the right unit. So we're going to take our tons of emissions, multiply it by a global warming potential, which ends up with our carbon dioxide equivalent, which we are using as our reporting unit for our GHG protocol. All right, so even though this last step seems a little redundant, you got to remember from high school that we got to keep our units consistent for it to mean anything. All right, so here is a real table from the McGill 2019 GHG inventory. It's a list of energy used by the scope and by campus. So we can uh, zoom in here to the McGill downtown campus. In 2019, it used almost um, 160 million kilowatts of electricity, kilowatt hours of electricity. So this would be our activity data. So for example, here we have energy consumption. Next, so we have our first activity data. Next, we would need our emission factor. So let's go back to refer to our GHG inventory. So all this information is contained in the standalone document of the inventory. This here is table six from the inventory, and it lists all of the emission factors they used for the reporting. So we're looking for the Quebec electricity emission factor, which is this one right here. So it'll refer us to the, um, the emission factors that they found. So these are pretty standardized things. People will have done the research and we go and refer to those. So from there, we are able to find it right there at the bottom, the consumption necessity. So it's CO2 equivalents per kilowatt hour and in 2018, which is, um, so sorry, 2018 is the most recent available data. So even though it isn't our 2019 data that we're looking for for this inventory, we're gonna use the 2019 data since so it is the most recent and available. And we'll make sure to state this clearly when we mention it in our GHG inventory. 
All right, so when we multiply it, we will have our 160 uh, million times 1.7. And we also want to make sure to put it in our right units. So in this case, we have um, it's given in grams and we want it in tons, which is how we're reporting it. So we want to just cancel out the units, crunch the numbers so that we end up with the tons of CO2 equivalent we're looking for, which gives us a total of 272 tons of CO2 equivalent. All right. Now, um, remember our estimate approach? Why didn't we have to multiply our energy by the, uh, the global warming potential? Does anyone know why? Why did we just skip that second equation? It's a pretty obvious answer. It's because we already had the right units. But I'm just mentioning it here again because they won't always be given in equivalent, GH, uh, in equivalent CO2s. So we want to make sure to always include that conversion. All right, so now I'm going to give you the opportunity to take a crack at calculating the emissions yourself. So she was going to paste some resources in the chat. And we are going to calculate the emissions from McGill's Bel Air's campus in Barbados. So you can find your activity data in the 2019 GHG inventory table nine. So that link will bring you to the 2019 GHG inventory. And we are going to be looking, I'll also write this in the chat, at the Bel Air's campus. So we're going to put you in breakout rooms again. But before we do that, let's just give you a quick little run through. Oops, sorry. Nope, that's not what I want to show. All right. So don't forget to use both equations. You're going to be needing table nine and table six, and you're going to try to find the carbon dioxide equivalent of emissions for McGill's Bel Air campus in Barbados. So she was going to put you back in breakout rooms for 10 minutes. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to call us in. One other really important thing is that you are going to have to use the combined margin emission factor. So when you go through, you're going to be using table nine to find the Bel Air's electricity demand. And you're also going to need to use the table six emission factors for the electricity in Barbados. All right, good luck. All right, so I hope your practice example was successful. I know group one got it. I didn't get to see group two, but uh, we'll run through it quickly to make sure we're all on the same track and we understand what we did. All right, so for our Bel Air's example, we went in kind of like I showed you. Remember, the first thing we need is our activities data. So in this case, uh, we were looking at the activities data of the electricity usage, and we found that in the table nine of McGill GHG inventory to be about 61,000. So we put in our 61,000 kilowatt hours, and we proceed on to find our emission factor. So we go back to our GHG inventory, and in our factors table, we were able to identify the electricity in Barbados kind of uh, row. And from there, we see where we sourced our emissions factor. So by looking at this, and if you Googled it, it should have been pretty easy to find the reference document. And you go down to uh, uh, annex number four, and you would have seen a table just like this one. So you'll simply look for the Barbados uh, row. And then we mentioned quickly that you wanted, it was also in the chat, that you wanted to look at the combined margin efficiency factor, uh, sorry, emission factor. So you would have selected the one that's highlighted right there. So this example we gave you was pretty straightforward, but sometimes it could be much more complicated. And then to find the submission factor in the first place is no small joke, especially if it isn't directly referenced to what you're looking for. So sometimes you'll be able, you know, might need to choose something that isn't exactly what you're looking for, but is close enough. And as long as you're transparent with that, it is perfect. So even for here, the data in this Bel Air example was not from 2019, but it's the closest that McGill could find. So that's what we went with. All right. So now we have the emission factor. So why can't we multiply these directly? And it's because the activity data is in kilowatt hours and the emission factor is in megawatt hours. So we need to make sure to make the appropriate conversions so that all our units cancel out. 
So we start off with our activity data and emission factor, and we do our, our unit conversion in which a thousand kilowatt hours is equal to one mega, uh, megawatt hour. So we cross off our units to double check. Cross them out there, cross them out there. And the final answer we're going to get is in tons of CO2 and to a total of 48.3. So are we done yet? Is this our final answer? Technically, no. So we always cannot forget our final equation. So we want to take our tons of emission, which we just calculated, and we're going to multiply it by our gloaming warming, global warming potential. So in this one, it may seem a little redundant because we are in tons of CO2. So our global warming potential, one ton of CO2 is equivalent to one ton of CO2 equivalent. But that isn't the case for other greenhouse gases. So that's why we're making it really explicit here. So then we're going to get 48.3 tons of CO2 equivalent. And that is the total of the emissions produced in the Bel Air's kind of example of the McGill inventory. So great job, guys. You just did your first calculation. And like I said, every other example following this will differ a little, but they're all going to be very similar in concept. And you always want to make sure to use the same equation, uh, the same equation to get consistency across your reporting. All right, so now we're on to our last section. And this one is gonna be about how to report your GHG emissions. So now you know the context, now you know how to get the meat of the material. This part kind of overviews what needs to be included into the report. So remember those principles we mentioned at the beginning? Those are back. We wanna make sure that all reports are relevant, complete, consistent, transparent, and accurate. So some best practices include using the best available data at the time of publication and being transparent about the limitations. Like for example, how we use 2018 hydro data for the 2019 report. Another best practice includes communicating discrepancies identified in previous years and reporting separately a company's gross and net emissions. So gross emissions are going to be the quantity that is consumed, so the entirety of it. When we talk about net emissions, it also has to do with any kind of like payback. So let's say we have an equivalent uh, solar farm or some, uh, let's say, like forest nearby that consumes CO2, you're going to have a net, but those reductions wouldn't be included in the gross. Oh, so sorry, here's more information about that. So this is how McGill chooses to publicize the gross versus net emissions. Since 2018, it has included the carbon sequestration of its various forested lands, like the Morgan Arboretum near Bank Campus or the Gold Nature Reserve. So these are two large forested areas that McGill uses to sequestrate its carbon. And that's the main reason for the net versus gross. You'll also notice that they have it sorted with and without biogenic emissions. Biogenic emissions are emissions that come from natural sources. In this case, partly uh, use biofuels for Mac campus shuttles. So they'll reuse the same thing. And these CO2 emissions must be reported separately. So now let's get into the required bits of the reporting. First off, you need a description of the company or organization as seen here. So here's a general description of McGill. You'll also need to clarify the reporting period. In this case, it was January 1st to December 21st, 2019. Oh, December 31st, so sorry, <laughs> the whole year. Um, after that, you need to clarify what systems, or like I called them, organizational boundaries you're using. McGill is in the operational control. So this one we were talking about, it either has 100% control or 0% control in terms of operations you need to state your operational boundaries, i.e. your scopes. Note that in scope one, McGill excludes processes, uh, process gases generated by research experiments as seen here. They explain the exemption saying that they don't have the data and the estimated emissions are deemed quite small. Um, sometimes you just gotta do the best you can do. So in this case, it was really very small for them and they didn't have it available. So they stated as so, and in being transparent, it still completed their complete um, GHG protocol. 
In terms of scope three, you need to explicitly state which activities you're included. For example, we have the list here below. These, like we've mentioned, are optional. So you are going to just state the ones that are included as kind of like a benefit to the report you've already created. Other required points uh, in the emissions data are any scope one or two emissions, and you want to differentiate between the offsets and the kind of used ones, so gross versus net. You want to also separate your emissions by scope one and two. You need to also include the emissions of all seven greenhouse gases, not only CO2, and um, separate CO2 emissions from biomass from other scopes. You need to also state your base year, like we spoke about, and the emissions profile uh, over time, any divestments or acquisitions. Um, the contacts for any base year calculations need to be stated every time, your calculation methodologies, and any exclusions of sources or operations. So this is really just a small list of the many things that you want to really make sure to include to make sure that your protocol is complete, accurate, and usable for years to come. Before you prepare your first report, I highly recommend you read a well-written report, like I would suggest the McGill 2019 report, but a lot of universities do do them and they are very complete. You also want to refer to the GHG protocol Bible, the actual corporate accounting and report, reporting standard. So this two hour session today is a condensed version of a 10 hour course provided by the protocol, which gives a really great overview, but there is an extensive amount of further learning that you could do through their organization uh, with respect to scope three, with respect to different types of organizations and so on. These aren't light reads, but they will definitely prepare you to give a really good, well-written report. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the GHG protocol also has trainings uh, to further your knowledge in other domains. So as you're aware, I've taken the first corporate standard training webinar and um, as well as a scope to guidance, but you can see that some of them here are even provided um, online for free, which is a great resource. And you can see that there's further ones on LCA accounting or mitigation and policy, which are all super interesting and I would highly recommend. Anyways, that's all for me today. I hope that you got a good base accounting uh, knowledge. And if you have any questions and you don't feel comfortable asking them now or they pop up in your mind later on, please feel free to email me. Uh, that's my email address right there. And uh, it was a pleasure getting to speak with you today. So uh, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Ashley. And if you have um, questions right now, please feel free to do so yes, sure. in the chat. And it'll take a few minutes to see if you have questions but if not um okay i'll give you 10 seconds every question <laughs> <laughs> find the unmute button this might be a random question go for it what is the toughest part of ghg accounting uh, okay, I'll answer them in order. What is the toughest part of GHG accounting? Uh, I think definitely is in finding those emission factors or measuring. So, I mean, if you want to measure your emissions, it can be practically impossible for a lot of processes. So we heavily rely on good accountable sources to take our emission factors from, but those aren't always easy to find, especially if they aren't for your specific um, activity sector. So let's say for agricultural and oil domains, a lot of them have been published, but then for new types of research or um, kind of niche things, it may not be available. So you'll find yourself doing a lot of research to find a similar activity or a similar year, or let's say emission data for a different location, because they can often be very specific. So I think that that researching of emission factors can be quite challenging if you don't have the resources to measure them yourself. Um, there is many different forums that are existing and being created now to further improve activities data. Um, well, those emission factors from activities data, and then to try to collect all the knowledge people are acquiring, but the, it, there still isn't like a Bible of you can just look it up. <laughs> and the next one is GHG accounting pretty much done uh, just the once a year. Yeah, so typically it's done on a yearly basis. Um, that is quite often what um, like company requirements are, and it's also what the GHG protocol kind of um, 
re not request, kind of recommends. Some people also do it more than a year. So let's say your company fluctuates as in one year you have a crazy amount of missions and the next year not so much and then it kind of repeats. Some people might do it over a longer period if two years more accurately represents uh, their operations. Uh, but I think most people go by their financial as well. So their fiscal year, most companies have their yearly reports done and they've started to include GHG accounting. So that's kind of the reason it goes for a year. And I'm thinking like with McGill, you get a good cycle. They could have probably done it by session as well, I guess, by, by semester. But uh, for them, it was the yearly that made more sense. Thank you for the questions. Those are really good ones.